Can we get into the message this morning? Are y'all ready to get in the message this morning? Okay. Go to Exodus, Exodus chapter 15. Exodus chapter 15, I'm going to start in verse 22. And I'm going to span uh, the end of this chapter, and I'm going to sneak into chapter 16 as well. As always, you can find all the message notes on the Bible app. Uh, If you have the Bible app, just go to it. Go to events. You can find all the notes in there. Exodus chapter 15, verse 22. This is what it says. Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went into the desert of Shur. For three days they traveled in the desert without finding water. When they came to Merah, they could not drink its water because it was bitter. So the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What are we to drink? Verse 25, Then Moses cried out to the Lord. The Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it into the water. The water became fit to drink. Some versions say it became sweet. There the Lord issued a ruling and instruction for them and put them to the test. If you've got a physical Bible or if you want to highlight in your Bible app or if you're taking notes, you want to circle that or write that down. Issued a ruling and instruction for them and put them to the test. Verse 26, he said, If you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought upon the Egyptians. For I am the Lord who heals you. And I want to skip to chapter 16, verse 2. Uh, This is about a month later, so about a month after that text. Uh, we find the Israelites a little further down the road. Now, it's, it's, it's noteworthy to know that from Merah, where it was bitter and there was this, this moment of, of desolation, looked desperate, they traveled for about a month in between uh, where they were in Mount Sinai. And so they, in that time span, they actually made a pit stop at a place called Elam that was full of great water. It was an oasis. There was trees. There was opportunity for rest there. So It hasn't been all bad leading up to this point about a month later. But look what it says. Chapter 16, verse 2. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out to this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. In verse 4. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day, gather enough for that day. In this way, you can circle this sentence as well. In this way, I will test them and see whether or not they will follow my instructions. I want to title my message this morning, Put to the Test. All right, let's pray. God, we thank you so much for what you're doing in this place. Thank you for a time of worship. Thank you for a moment that we can just seek your word and understand what it is that you have to say to us. Uh, God, we just ask that you bless this time, make it holy, let these words not be mine, but let it come from you, in your name we pray, amen. Um, So many of you know this, um, because we have not stopped talking about it, but a few months ago, me and my wife became parents for the first time, and uh, here's a picture, here's a picture of my little family, okay, this is at my brother's wedding a few weeks ago, and uh, that's me, my wife Lauren, and then our little daughter, uh, she's about two months old, Ellie. Uh, this is the kind of picture you put on Instagram, right? Like, this is the, this is the one you get framed. Uh, we're looking smile. You try getting a two-month-old to smile for a picture. My goodness, that's the best we could get. Uh, so this is, this is a beautiful little picture of our family. This is the one we show you guys at church and put on Facebook. Uh, but if you haven't had a newborn for a while, uh, this is what it also looks like. Uh, we're going to put the, yeah, that one, okay? Um, and I asked Laura, I was like, does it make me a bad parent? She started crying. My watch said loud noise alert. And I was like, I got to take a picture of this. Um, this is also what it looks like. We get asked a lot, hey, is she a good baby? And absolutely she is. What else do you think I'm going to say? <laughs> like, you ask me if she's a good baby. Of course she's a good baby. She's our baby. She is, is, what am I going to say? Is she a holy terror? No, like she is a precious little baby. And the truth is, as good of a baby as she is, she still tests us sometimes. Uh, We were married for 12 years before we had our daughter. 12 years. Now, it was not by choice that it was that long. Uh, We wanted a kid for a long time. God finally answered our prayer. We're so happy for it. But we got used to living our lives just the two of us. We got used to life, just us. We could go do whatever we wanted, whenever we wanted. If we wanted to go take a random trip somewhere, we'd go do it. If we wanted to go out to eat spontaneously to a sushi place, we'd go do it. And all that changed when our daughter came into the world. 
And when an infant enters your world, there's just an element of testing. Parents, you know, I'm learning this, okay? She tests how much we can accomplish with zero sleep. I told somebody uh, earlier today, you know, I was like, hey, I pray for five hours. Five hours would be a godsend of, of sleep for me. She tests our time, how much time we can commit to stuff. I'm, I'm fortunate enough, I get to work from home a lot when I need to. And the times I'm at home, and Lauren's home on maternity leave, and our daughter is there, there's not a lot that gets done some days. She tests our time. She tests our patience, just like with that picture. <laughs> Sometimes, 3 o'clock in the morning, she's crying. Okay, here we go. Let's, let's get into it. She tests our gag reflexes sometimes. Any parents know what I'm talking about? But all of these are so worth it to us. I remember before we had her, I was so nervous about ha handling a dirty diaper. <laughs> or when she spit up in my face for the first time. Or when I'm carrying her into the bath and she like poops in my hand. Like I'm, I was terrified of these moments, but when it's your kid, none of that matters. You don't care anymore. And here's, here's the point I'm trying to make. The children of Israel in this story, in the whole Exodus story, went through a lot of tests. You saw two verse, verses right there that God said, this is a time to test them. This text that we just read follows immediately after the Red Sea crossing. So the children of Israel have been uh, freed from captivity, 400 plus years of enslavement. Freed, crossed this Red Sea in an epic moment that all of us remember the Charlton Heston movie from. Follows this event, Pharaoh is gone, long behind them. Now three days after that, they've been wandering aimlessly wandering. They think they know where they're going, but they're just kind of wandering. Three days without food or water, or at least water. And now they're left with this question, now what? We, we've escaped captivity, but now what? So what do they do? Something that would become pretty common with this nation during this exodus. They complain. <laughs> this nation of Israel is the most complaining nation I've ever read about in, in the Bible. They're constantly complaining. God had provided rescue, but now for God, it was time to find out what kind of people they actually were. Were they a worshipful people? Were they a kind of people that trusted God completely, wanted to follow what he had for them, trusting him with his steps, worshiping God every chance they got, honoring the laws, who just occasionally rebelled? Or were they a rebellious people, untrusting of God, uh, had selfish, had their own agenda in mind, who just occasionally worshipped. This is who God is trying to figure out who they are. And to find this out, God did two things, okay? He did two things. Number one, he gave them instruction. Scripture says that he gave them instruction. Verse, chapter 15, verse 25, there the Lord issued a ruling and instruction for them. So he gave them a list of rules to follow. He said, if you will just do what I say, here are some laws, here are some things to abide by, here are guidelines for you to follow. If you will do these things, then we're going to be okay. The second thing he did, he tested them on these instructions. Chapter 16, verse 4, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. Um, we just got done honoring the class of 2023. Can we give it up for them one more time, by the way? Come on. They deserve it. And every senior or graduate in this building, every one of them, had to take tests. They had to pass exams in order to graduate. But the tests that they were given throughout their entire schooling career, none of those tests were ever given without first instructed. That would be silly. Like they were, what would be the point in that, giving a test without first being instructed? Now, sometimes these kids go, you didn't tell me about that. Well, maybe it's because you weren't paying attention. <laughs> But instruction usually precedes an exam. And so let's, let's get some scripture to back this up. First Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you. Don't be surprised. Why? Because God has told us this. Jesus told us there will be times you will be tested. Proverbs 17, 3 says that the Lord tests hearts. James 1, 12 says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life. Testing our faith or trials are mentioned over 50 more times throughout Scripture. So obviously this is an area that God cares deeply about. and He wants us to understand. He wants us to know it's coming. So today, what I want to do is I want to take a few minutes. I want to talk through 
some of the tests that we might find. Okay, There's two tests that we can find that we can use the, the children of Israel, the, the Israelites, in this story of Exodus and how we can apply it to our lives. Okay, uh, Number one, if you're a note taker, you love this because I'm going to let you know exactly when to take notes. Okay, The first one is the taste test. I don't know about you guys, but I, I, my YouTube and TikTok algorithm is just full of food videos, okay? There's a reason. Like, I mean, I love watching food videos, taste testing videos, people trying to figure out what, what's the best soda, uh, who makes the best chicken sandwich, Chick-fil-A, um, what, what's the best of whatever food there is out there. I just, for some reason, it's just entertaining to me. And there are YouTubers that have built their entire career on videos just ranking stuff and tasting stuff. Um, but this is a test that relies on our own senses. And this is a problem because our senses will oftentimes lie to us. You cannot rely on your own senses because your sense, you may think uh, Zaxby's chicken sandwich is the best. Why? I don't know, but maybe you do. Our senses may be different, and our senses can often lie to us. There are things that taste good, but they turn out to be bad bad for you, or they mess you up. And there are things that taste bad that are actually for our good. Let me give you a couple of examples. Um, if you've ever traveled internationally before, then you know that we as Americans are the weird ones. Believe it or not, okay, we're the weird ones. And it's not because of the last decade of our pol political system. Uh, it has more to do that apparently we are the only ones in the world who like ice in our drinks. Like, Nobody else, everywhere I've been internationally, they don't care about ice. They will give you tepid, lukewarm water, and they'll just say, this is fine, yes? Um, we as Americans, though, we, we, we want ice. Like, you will pick where you go because of their ice. Shout out Sonic, Chick-fil-A, Slim's, like, can I, can I get an amen? Anybody like the nugget ice? Um, you will pick where you go based on if they have good ice or not. There are people I know, they will go to, to a place, and they will just order a cup of ice. <laughs> just so they can munch on it. I'm like, you need some iron in your life. Like, come on. But around the world, they don't value ice like this. Sometimes they'll have ice drinks, but like most of the time, it's just tepid, lukewarm water. Here you go. In, in Macau, in China, when we would go there, first time we went was culture shock for us because we went to a little cafe and they brought us hot water. Like, just in a little mug, like, here's your, like, you, know, you go to a restaurant, they give you some water. It was hot water. I'm like, is this for tea? No, it's just water. Why? <laughs> Why would you do it? Because China, this area, like, it's, it's so humid. It makes Arkansas summer look like a New York fall. Like, it is so warm and humid there. And I'm like, why in the world are you giving me hot water? Like, it's more hydrating this way. I'm like, I don't care. I miss, I miss sonic eyes. <laughs> So finally, I got tired of it. The third year we were there, I finally got tired of it. We went to a grocery store, and it was like manna coming from heaven. Like, I saw the, the freezer out, and there was bagged ice there. I was like, where have you been the last three years? And so I go over there. I check out with the bag of ice. I put it in our freezer back at the apartment. And then every morning for the next few days, I would, I would put some of that crushed ice up into my water bottle. I'd fill it up with water, and I would just, man, my tongue, my body, my soul just rejoiced in the Lord. I just had a spiritual moment. And I knew, I had traveled enough to know that you don't drink the water in other countries, especially a place like China. I knew this. I always drank bottled water. For some reason, I forgot that ice is made of water. <laughs> you want to know what happened to me after a couple of days of ingesting that ice? Expelleramus. Like, I mean, just... It was not good for my body, my soul, or my mind. Like, it messed my system up. It was not good. Tasted good, actually bad for me. Let me give you the flip side of something that tastes bad but is actually good. Kale. Nobody likes it. Why do we keep pretending that we like it? If you say you like kale, come on, you're lying, okay? We're in church. You can be honest. You're just trying to be cool and, and, and crunchy, right? Nobody likes kale. Nobody likes it. It tastes bad, but supposedly good for you, at least healthier than a Wendy's Baconator. But the people of Israel often relied on this taste test. They would go throughout the entire Exodus story, and if any time something didn't taste good to them, they would complain. They would complain. They struggled so many times in the wilderness because they were basing what they were experiencing on their feelings. 
Read the Exodus story. So many times you'll see that they would wish they had died in Egypt rather than go what they're going through. Because what they were tasting wasn't very good. Does God want good things for us? Yes. The point is not for us to be miserable all the time, but to understand that life is about balance. So for each of these tests, I want to give an answer key for the test. Okay. So what's the answer to the taste test? It's maturity and trust. The answer to this taste test is being mature enough to know that it's not always about my feelings, that going through this life and experiences is not always about what I want, but it's trusting that God knows what's best for me sometimes. In fact, all the time. Paul gives us a great example of how easily that we can be influenced. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14 says, Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching, by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Paul knows, he knew, we, we are easily influenced. We, we, we are in our flesh all the time. If something tastes good, we, wanna, we, wanna, we want it more. If something feels good, then we're going to lean toward that. It's hard for us to embrace the struggle. It's hard for us to embrace the difficulty. But this is why the author, or let me go back, the word for tossed back and forth that's used there in Ephesians is the same word used to describe the stormy sea of Galilee in Luke chapter 8. So it's talking about this same tossed back and forth that we feel means like a boat that is just getting tossed around. Over and over, this way and that way, wishy-washy, no direction, just floating aimlessly. It's why the author of Hebrews and Chapter 6, verse 19 says, we have this hope, talking about our faith in God, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. So we don't have to be based on our feelings. We have a hope that we can anchor to. If we will have maturity and trust in God, he will provide clarity and stability. You look back at this story, and, and let's, let's take it a step further. Jamie Buckingham, he is an, apparently an expert in drought conditions, and he wrote a book, A Way Through the Wilderness, where he talks about the, the, the Hebrew Exodus. And I want to I read this. He noted that the water from Merrow was filled with magnesium, which is a powerful laxative that would have expelled amoeba, parasites, and death-dealing germs the Israelites would have brought with them out of Egypt. Magnesium also forms the basis of a drug called dolomite, which athletes use when training in extreme hot weather to control heart fibro fibrillation, and muscle spasms. In other words, when the children of Israel got to Merah and they experienced this water, it was bitter to them. They didn't want it, but God knew they needed to have it to get rid of anything left in them that was from Egypt, to give them health on their journey, to give them stamina on their journey. So he provided a miracle. He provided a way. He turned the water sweet and said, you may not want this, but I'm going to provide a way so you can have it because it's necessary. The second test is the results test. The results test. This test teaches us that the best thing we can learn are often things that we have failed at in the past. And it directly hits at our pride and our selfish, selfish nature. And unfortunately for a lot of us, it's really hard to admit the thing that we've been doing isn't working. It's really hard for us to, to admit that. Uh, there's a story I read this week town called Enterprise, Alabama, all right? Now, not many things good come from Alabama, but this story is a good one. Uh, this town, like many in the South in the 1800s, relied heavily on the cotton industry. Um, they produced cotton, they grew it, they cropped, they, they, whatever farmers do to do all that stuff with cotton, they did all the things. Their main source of income for the entire town, their main source of economy, their entire town depended on cotton. By the end of the 1800s, boll weevils came to the states from Mexico. They came up through Texas and started just migrating and sweeping through it. By 1903, the U.S. government declared it an agricultural epidemic. The weevils made their way into Enterprise, Alabama in 1909, and within a couple years, the cotton production for this town and the surrounding areas had dwindled down to 10% of what it previously was. 1915, a seed broker by the name of H.M. Sessions, he said, we've, we've got to figure out something to do to save this town. And he had just been to Virginia and North Carolina where they were growing this thing that was, it was able to grow, but it wasn't as popular. It wasn't a necessity like cotton was. It was something called peanuts. 
And he said, have you guys considered growing peanuts? You kind of have the right climate for it. It might do well. And this was a gamble because this is not something everybody really needed. It was more of a, a luxury. It, was, it, was, it hadn't really been used like it is today. But by 1917, after they had taken the gamble, 1917, regional farmers produced over 1 million bushels of peanuts that sold for more than $5 million. That is $87 million in today's money. It became, this city became the number one outsource for peanuts. Two years later, I don't have the picture, but two years later, they commissioned a statue in Enterprise, Alabama. You can Google it if you don't believe me. Enterprise, Alabama, it is this, it is this woman, it's this white statue of a, of a woman, and she is holding up on a platter a giant boll weevil. They put this in the middle of their town, just a giant statue of a boll weevil. Oh, hello. Inscribed on it are the words this. This is what it says. In profound appreciation of the boll weevil and what it has done as the herald of prosperity, this monument was erected by the citizens of Enterprise, Coffee County, Alabama. They put up a statue of a boll weevil, something that caused them dread, something that nearly broke the entire town, something that caused tragedy and left people on the brink of homelessness and had people moving out of that place. They put up a statue. Craig, what's your point? How many of us are still planting cotton when God is trying to move us to peanuts? How many of us are saying, well, this is the way we've always done it. This is the way I've always done it. This is the, this is the mindset I've always had. And this, this worked for my parents and my grandparents. And this is just the way it's supposed to be. Did you know God wants to do something new in you? God wants to do something unique to you, through you, and in you. But for so many of us, we are, we're trying to do what we've always done. We're trying to grow this cotton plants, and God's saying, I'm trying to move you away to something new. If what you're doing isn't working, have you considered that it's what you want to do and not what God wants you to do? The last three weeks, Kevin's been bringing us a word about worship, and he's been talking about how we can kind of tear down some of these mindsets of 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 this is the way it's always been, or this is how I've always done it, and really have an experience with God. If you haven't watched those or listened to those, go back. All three of them are now available. Like, go, go listen to them, because they're really good. And this point helps drive it home. Like, sometimes we got to let go of, of what we think is the right thing to do and trust God. The Bible references 14 major times that the people of Israel complained. 14 times that were major enough that it made it into Scripture. Let me run through them really quickly. Okay, I'm not going to go into detail. I'm just going to list what they are. Exodus chapter 5, the people complained to Moses that because of him and his talk of a promised land, Pharaoh made things worse. Exodus 14, the people complained and said to Moses, leave us alone. Exodus 15, the people complained about the bitter water. Exodus 16, the people complained about being hungry. God gives them manna. Exodus 17, the people complained about being thirsty. Exodus 32, the people forsake the Lord and worshiped a golden calf. Numbers 11, the mixed multitude of people complained about food. Moses wants to die at this point. Numbers 12, Miriam and Aaron complain about Moses' leadership. Numbers 14, the people complain about how difficult it looked to conquer the giants in the land, so they refused to enter the promised land. I want to pause there for a second. Their attitude was so toxic. They would have rather stayed in the wilderness than advance to the place, the destination that they were going to. This is the state of their attitude. Numbers chapter 14, the people complained again and wanted to kill Moses. Then they tried to select a different leader. Number 16, key leaders rebel against Moses. Later on in number 16, the people complained again. They accused Moses of killing God's people. Numbers 20, the people contend, contended with Moses again because of no water. Moses again gets angry. And finally, Numbers 21, the people complained against God and Moses. Now, at this point, Numbers 21, God finally has enough. He's done. He's heard everything he needs to hear. He's over it. So he sends, this is straight from the word of God. Go look it up if you don't believe me. He sends serpents to go start taking people out. Don't you wish? I'm not going to go there. God has enough. He starts sending snakes, poisonous snakes, to start taking people out. This gets their attention. They're like, oh, okay, we must have done something wrong. I guess decades of complaining have finally caught up to us. So they, 
they talk to Moses, they seek God, they ask for forgiveness, and God does this in verse 8. I thought this was so incredible. God does this, verse 8, Numbers 21, verses 8 and 9. Then the Lord told Moses, make a replica of a poisonous snake and attach it to a pole. All who are bitten will live if they simply look at it. So Moses made a snake out of bronze, attached it to a pole, that anyone who was bitten by the snake could look at the bronze snake and be healed. This is some serious Old Testament stuff right here. Like This is textbook Old Testament God. And this is the last mention of the people of Israel complaining. And it seems like a strange solution, right? Like this is, this is kind of unlike God. This is, like, this, is, this is different. Until you realize that the reason God sent poisonous snakes is because it was a symbol of their own poisonous nature. He sent these poisonous snakes to start biting people because that's what they were exactly doing to Moses and the leadership and to God. And by looking directly at the snake for healing, they were forced to deal with their own problem face to face. The results test. Are you mature enough to handle looking at your problems head on, face to face? I'd say God knows what he's doing in this situation. So what's the answer to this test? Honesty and surrender. Can you look back at your life with honesty and surrendering your own selfish desires and your own game plan? Say, maybe the way I've been doing it is not right. Maybe all this complaining I'm doing, maybe it's just causing more pain. Maybe me trying to beat down this door because I think it's stuck, is really locked, and God has an open door right next to it. Are we able to look at our past and say, I gotta change something? Are we able to pray the prayer that David did in Psalm chapter 139, verses 23, where he said, God, examine me. Know my mind. Test me. Know all of my worries. Make sure I'm not gonna go the wrong way. Lead me on the path that's always been right. When you ask God to search you, and you come at it with, from an honest place of saying, God, I really do want you to search me, you need to be prepared to hear things you don't want to hear. You need to be prepared to hear God say, okay, you asked for it, here we go. I'm going to open up some wounds you thought were closed but have really just been septic in your life. I'm going to identify toxic relationships that maybe you have. I'm going to put people around you to hold you accountable to these things. Can we be honest with ourselves? Can we surrender enough to look back at our past and, and, and say, you know what, maybe I didn't do it the right way. Maybe my way is not the way that God says is best. Let me land this thing very quickly. If you go back and if you look at our, our text that we read, Exodus 15 and 16, and really several, if you look through those times of complaining that the Israelites did, you'll notice a reoccurring theme that pops up, food and drink. They're thirsty. They're hungry. There's not enough to eat. We're thirsty. God, we're, we're tired of the manna. Can you give us something else? Like, there are many moments where they, they struggle, with, where they're really longing to be satisfied. They feel just the twinge of emptiness but they're longing to be satisfied. Centuries later, 2023, we're looking for the same thing. There was a Harris poll last year that said only 33% of Americans consider themselves satisfied in life. Only 33% of people would say, I'm, my heart is full. I'm satisfied. I'm in, I'm in a good place. I'm in a healthy relationship. I'm, my faith walk is good. My, my life is good. I feel good. Two out of three of you are in a place where you feel empty. You feel unfulfilled. You feel like something is missing. You don't feel satisfied in life. We are desperate for mental, emotional, and spiritual nourishment. So what do we do? We complain. We get in our feelings. We start taste testing stuff. We start consuming things that feel good, even though they may be bad for us. 
We start saying, well, this, this worked for other people. Well, maybe it'll work for me. And we start failing these tests that God's trying to give us in search of sustenance. But for those of you in the room that may be in that season, in that place right now, let me give you some good news. John 6, 30 through 35, this is what it says. So they asked him, him being Jesus, what sign then will you give us that we can see it and believe you? And I think a lot of us are asking the same thing in church today. God, I need you to give me a sign. I need you to tell me something so that I can believe that you have the best for me. What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it's written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. God provided to them. What are you going to do? And Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, it's not Moses who has given you bread from heaven, but it's my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Verse 34, they they get that check in their spirit. Sir, always give us this bread. Like, you mean a kind of bread that can feed the world? A kind of of bread that can sustain people? For I want that. And Jesus declared, I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me, you won't grow hungry. Whoever believes in me will not be thirsty. Jesus points back at himself and he says, look, You are searching for something that will be temporary. You are searching for something that won't last. But if you come to me, you will never want again. You know where your next meal comes from because it always comes from him and he never runs out. The test we're taking, guys, it's an open book test. Like we have the answers to it. His name is Jesus.